This is the Art Beauty Podcast, where we tell the real truth about the fake shit. And boy, do we have an episode for you. I'm Amber Milton. Today, my gorgeous and fabulous co-host is Diana Wilson. She is the founder of Saints and Sinners Hair Care. She has been on New Beauty Live. She's a friend of the show. We absolutely adore her. Um, and her hair care line is absolutely fabulous. Diana, welcome. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Thank you, Amber. It is such an honor to be here. And let me say, you look so amazing. I would kill for your hair. Oh, well, thank you. It's a, a testament to using great products and being mindful of the ingredients being put on your locks, certainly. Yeah, which is so, so important. Um, where, where are you today? I am in our home office just outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, nice. that's how I've got my beanie on, my jacket, a little chilly. I was going to say, you look so cool and not cold, but you look so like stylish and fabulous. I love a beanie. It's crazy because it's like basically May and it's still cold in New York. It was like 40 degrees this morning. Yeah. We have, we have a saying here, you know, April showers brings May showers here in Portland. Yeah. So, okay. You know, it's just, it just never stops. So yeah. Does it yeah. never stop raining? It never stops. I've heard we really get, cool things about over, Portland. That's about it. I, you get a little bit of what? Snow? We get a little window of sunshine oh. in the summer, but that's about it. Right. I mean, I feel like I I need the sunshine so bad. I always tell people it's not, if I'm moving to Florida, it's when. And I'm hoping that that is sooner than later. Although that brings its own special set of hair problems. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, Amber, I'd really love to share um some information about what goes on behind the velvet curtain, so to speak, um, you know, sort of a hair care confessional. You know, I've been in this industry for almost 40 years. I've um, traveled the globe educating stylists. I've worked for international hair care companies. And like you said, I'm, I'm uh, the owner of Saints and Sinners Hair Care, the brand that I am absolutely most proud of. Um, but, you know, I think consumers would be surprised to know how products are actually born. I know, and you agreed, which I cannot believe, to sort of give us these hair care confessionals and sort of like the dirty secrets of the industry. Yep. Um, now, uh, I understand that maybe we're not gonna name specific names, but you'll forgive me if I pry a little bit. Um, wh where do you wanna start? Like maybe let's just start at the beginning. Like how do most hair care companies sort of come about because there's so many these days. Absolutely. Absolutely. We see so many on the market. And, and first of all, there are products like Saints and Sinners that are, that are handcrafted where we've invested in, you know, really knowing where our ingredients come from and years of experience. And then there's the, also the flip side of the industry, um, which has zero barrier of entry, uh, entry um, which is called the contract manufacturer. So right. Anyone can waltz into a contract manufacturer with an existing product that they've just purchased off a store shelf and say, make me this product, or do you have anything like this? And you don't have to be an industry expert or have any sort of knowledge to do that. You could be, you know, an air conditioner technician or a plumber, and you can walk into a contract manufacturer and say, can you reverse engineer this product or make me this product? Or do you have anything that you're already making? To like do that now, uh, but okay. So I guess, so I, I, you know, it's so funny. I've worked in the beauty industry for so long. I've never even heard the term contract manufacturer. I have to imagine though, that like, when you say you can walk in, like this costs money to do, right? Not, not necessarily. It depends on the contract manufacturer. Some contract manufacturers will say, you know, um, you know, yes, we're willing to work with you on your limited budget. And if you think about that, Amber, you know, what does that mean for the quality of your, your formulation? So if right. you've got a contract manufacturer who's willing to say, yes, we're going to work with you. Yes, you've got limited resources. What does that say to the quality of your ingredients? Are you going to be able to utilize the best ingredients, the most right. luxurious ingredients? Well, on, on the low end, what, what, what is that? What, like, let's talk about cost. Can you give us ballpark ranges for what that is? I'm, I'm fascinated. Well, there's such a huge, dis huge disparity when it comes to ingredient costs. And, you know, it's, it's basically 
what is the end goal here? So if you look at somebody like Saints and Sinners and us, you know, it's not about um, the price of the formulation. It's about the performance of the product while keeping it sure. safe. You know, those safer ingredients and doing the right things like irritation testing, patch testing, allergen mm-hmm. testing, that drives the cost of a formula up. Whereas a lot of these people who waltz into a contract manufacturer, limited budgets, no industry experience and not really willing to spend the extra money in developing a product that's not only luxurious, but safe. Cause they just want to get their product out there. But like what you, you still haven't given me a ballpark cost. I'm curious on that. Are we talking about $5,000, $10,000, $50,000, $250,000? You know, if, if, if let's say, you know, and I, I hate to say it, but I'm going to, let's say you're a celebrity right? And a celebrity waltzes into a contract manufacturer and says, you know, I'm, I'm famous and I'm going to utilize my name to create some brand awareness. They may not have to pay anything, but it can be a couple thousand dollars. It could be a hundred thousand. So there is a huge range. You know, I guess in some ways it's all, you know, it's nice to know though, in some ways that it is an accessible opportunity for people who might not have giant corporate budgets of hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I hear what you're saying is, is at some point, then you're not going to have the top quality ingredients. Right. And you're also going to have, um, so a contract manufacturer doesn't just have one customer. They've got right. a bunch different customers. So are you really getting something that's unique and artisanal and luxurious, or are you getting something that's already being manufactured for another brand? And you know, what's interesting is, you know, these people who waltz into these contract manufacturers and say, I want a hydrating shampoo. They're given a hydrating shampoo that may already be manufactured for a different brand already on the market. So you're seeing the same formula is being utilized in a number of different brands. And, you know, in all fairness, the Food and Drug Administration does recognize the fact that if you change an ingredient, a percentage, it does qualify as a new product. Right. However, there, there's brand A doesn't know that brand B is actually using their formula that's been on the market for a number of years. So right. you see a lot of saturation of the same old stuff. You don't see a lot of product innovation, nor do you see the safety mechanisms we at Saints and Centers like to have in place. So let's talk about, um, you know, for, as a consumer, you know, when we're trying to read the ingredient labels, I mean, these days there are so many reviews that people rely on and there are so many, I feel like the consumers have really stepped up their game in sort of policing these companies. Um, but, but what are things to look for? What should you not be looking for? Is there any way that we at home can pick up a product and say, yeah, this looks good. And I'm assuming that real R&D went into this. Right. You know, that is such a valid, um, Uh, point, Amber, and thank goodness that people are actually taking the time to read those labels, to educate themselves. And I mean, it is just so um, comforting to me. And I think what we first need to look at is the hero ingredient, right? So the hero ingredient story. So I'm a hairstylist, but I also have a bachelor's degree and I can spot this marketing shtick a mile away. And so for decades, brands, not just in the hair care space, but in the, in the skincare space, they've all used the latest ingredients, uh, latest ingredient, greatest hero ingredient to attract consumers and sell products. They put it on the front of their package. And, and the, the challenge with that kind of a situation is those hero ingredients will have a lifespan, right? Till the next hero ingredient to attract consumers and market products and, and that kind of thing. So first and foremost, really look at those hero ingredient stories. Okay. Um, don't use a hero ingredient story simply because we believe it's about the totality of a formulation. It's not just about one singular ingredient. All ingredients matter. And, you know, I can tell you, interestingly enough, about some of the hero ingredient stories that have turned out to be maybe a little bit of a nightmare down the road. Oh, like so, what? I was going to so, ask you, like, tell us about some of these hero ingredients. So first and foremost, um, some of these are really off-putting to me, but I think they really illustrate the point. Um, Let's talk about bone marrow. 
So bone marrow was a hero ingredient being billboarded on the fronts of packages, you know, and I don't eat meat. I'm not judging if you do, but well, I, don't, I don't. I was going to say, when you're talking about bone marrow, if you've never had bone marrow before at home, it is the most, it's like meat butter. It is so delicious. Now you are probably cringing right now, Diana. I didn't realize you didn't eat meat, but mama here, I cannot get enough. Give me right. all the bone and, marrow. Know, and that and that's fantastic. Perception is reality, right? So I would never discount you a bone marrow broth, but maybe I don't want to- No, not broth. Like actually there. when you have bone marrow, they cut open a bone. I, I, I think they, they heat it or I, you know, and I don't know what they do to it, but it comes in the bone and you literally scoop it out like jelly. Right. And that's how they got it into hair care. They got, got it, it into hair care. You're going to envelop those consumers in bone broth. That was a big hero ingredient story. Another one was lanolin derived from sheep's wool. So okay. that was a big one from the seventies. Like let's use lanolin as a hero ingredient. Um, silk was also a big one for the past I remember 10 to 20 silk years. protein. Yes. I yeah. had it. I mean, like back in the nineties and, and 2000s, it was like the silk protein serums were like all the rage. Absolutely. No good? And well, you know, it's just until the latest and greatest comes around and it, and most silk is, you know, it's a non-vegan issue. It's a non-vegan product. It's derived from silkworms and, cocoons. and so we have moved into syn synthesized silks, but it's another one that's been billboarded. And here's some of the really scary ones. You remember lead based eyeliner, no. lead eyeliner. Absolutely. No. That was I think 30s and 40s, that was the hero ingredient. Let's pony that lead right up to our eye. Also, arsenic powders for lightening and brightening the face. I mean, right. what could go wrong? With well, I mean, but you know, on, on the flip side of that, Botox. When Botox came out, I was like, wait a minute, you want me to put botulism poisoning, which I have learned that like I can never ever eat out of a dented can because I'm so terrified of this. And you want me to inject that into my face? And 20 years right. later, because Botox just celebrated its 20th birthday, I'm like, mama cannot get enough. Right. And you know, that's a great point because in the medical profession, we may have different regulations, but right. in the beauty hair space, the FDA, wild the food drug, wild, wild west, they're only going to get involved until we've already seen there's a problem. Right. So it makes no sense to me. Let's wait until we have issues to actually get involved and see if those ingredients are safe. So, you know, it is up to the consumer to really be educated because, yeah. you know, you know, look at soy. Soy was a big one being used and billboarded on the fronts of packages. And we now know that it causes, you know, issues with, with the endocrine, endocrine system, disruptors, yep. especially in men. And, you know, uh, we can talk about parabens and phthalates too. I mean, right. that's, that's a huge one to me. It, that one's a really, really personal one to me. So, um, you know, one of the ones that I, I hear come up a lot and, and I've heard both sides of this, um, which I love your spin on silicone. Silicone seems to be a sweet spot. Now I have a silicone um, based uh, uh, sunscreen that I use every day and I love it. And I used to use other products in, in my hair with silicone because it would make it shiny and smooth. And I remember my best friend, Ryan, hairstyles would be like, no, bad. So what, what, is, what is your take on it? Yeah, you know, that is such a hotly contested ingredient. And what's great to be able to say here today is both sides of the aisle are correct. So those pro siliconers like you and that skincare, you're correct. Your friend who said, Ugh, bad, stay away. He's also right. And, you know, it's so hotly debated. And, you know, first of all, what is a silicone? You know, a silicone is it's organic. It's non-irritating, it's derived from sand, it's non-reactive, -rea and it's gentle enough for babies. But in keeping with ingredient choices, there are thousands of different kinds of silicones. You okay. have really, really bad silicones, really, really good silicones. Your really, really bad silicones are those really large molecule silicones that park themselves on the cuticular layer of your hair. So that outside layer of your hair, okay. and they prohibit, they prohibit um, those good ingredients from your deep conditioners from penetrating. They're really gummy, these silicones. They, they keep, um, you know, they can interfere with color services from keratin straightening services. They really can get in the way of a lot of um, things that we like to do in the salon and at home. Um, then you've also got your really good silicones. You're very expensive and, and Amber, 
these silicones are so expensive that they actually are a smaller molecular weight and they are delivery systems. So they're carriers and all they do is help get the other ingredients where they need to go. And a lot of them, like we use at Saints and Sinners, actually evaporate. So, okay. you know, there are good silicones, there are horrible silicones and, you know, looking for those products that maybe weren't birthed at a contract manufacturer, utilizing those better ingredients Safe way you, to keep, go. You, know, you keep going back to this contract manufacturer. How is, you know, the consumer at home, how are we supposed to know where this product was birthed, whether it was in a lab within, you know, a company's own R&D or if it's at a contract manufacturer? I mean, is there any way to spot the difference? You know, there really isn't. And all I can say to that and how I can speak to that is in the performance. You know, you're using a skincare, a sunscreen, I think you said, that does yeah. have the silicone molecule that is absolutely fantastic, right? And so let's say you pick up a really inexpensive smooth, smoothing serum that maybe was birthed at a contract manufacturer that isn't using an expensive silicone that really does feel gummy after a couple of uses on your hair. Well, then you're going to know the proof right. is going to be in the pudding versus something like one of our products that actually washes clean. Got it. So. Okay. I mean, so it sounds like to me, you know, in this, and we as consumers are a little bit at a disadvantage because there is no real way to know, which goes back to what we were talking about at the top of the show, reviews and, you know, the, the sort of consumer policing of this industry is super important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I got to I got to bring up. Can I can I talk about women owned brands for a second? Sure. So, you know, all brands should be formulating for performance and safety, safety above anything else. Take right. the time to do the testing, to make sure that your products are safe and that when they hit the market, they are not gonna do any harm to people. You know, right. We all have that responsibility and we all should have that responsibility. Well, do you remember, but, was it was it the when hair care? Oh, I do. Remember I do. that? I and, do. And, and you just feel like you're at a disadvantage. I had a girlfriend. She, she had curly, curly hair like yours. She loved when she said it was the only thing that helped. I don't know if she still uses it, but I remember when all of these women were saying it was falling out. Do you know? Do you know whatever happened with that by any chance? No, I do. Believe, I I don't exactly. Do you recall maybe a, a class action? But I but I'm yeah. Not sure, but, but I, I think he's still. I think they're still producing. They're still selling. Right. Right. You know. And um. It, in that, in that vein, also you look at, you know, kind of jumping back to hero ingredients, you know, I've got three daughters who have yeah. anaphylactic allergies to nuts and you've got, oh. you've got brands billboarding almond oil on the front of their package, completely tone deaf. That stuff causes contact dermatitis. It causes eczema, psoriasis. It can also cause anaphylactic reactions. You've got macadamia nut oil. I mean, there is a real responsibility to formulate for safety first and foremost. Right. And, you know, I look at these women owned brands and to me, this is really, really serious. You know, we all want to help women owned brands do well. We want to, you know, to the sisterhood, you know, we want to see forward moving progress. Nothing makes me happier as the mother of three daughters, but are these brands using this moniker to simply sell products? Um, because there are women owned brands who are using ingredients that are known to be toxic to women like parabens and phthalates. I mean, it really is disingenuous to me. And I really, I really feel like we as women should hold those brands accountable. No, I know we said we weren't gonna name names, but are are there, no, you're not gonna name names. I can name ingredients. I'm happy to name ingredients. Got it, um, you don't wanna you know, name. If so if, if your product has a paraben, if it's got a phthalate in the, in the package, please stop using it because that is being absorbed into your skin through your hands, or if, let's even talk about a leave-in that is actually being left on your scalp and being right. absorbed into your bloodstream. And they have shown that breast cancer cells feed on parabens in laboratory settings. Right. My mother died on her 50th birthday from breast cancer. My best Sorry. friend, also an Amber died at 38 from ovarian cancer. So I take issue with yeah. Amber best member. I definitely take issue with women-owned brands, marketing to women, selling products to women, 
while hurting women in the process. If I oh, had it can't. with her. So again, that kind of because we can't name them, let, let's move on from this. But with this good notion that like, don't just support a woman owned brand because they're women, you still need to look into the technology. Absolutely. You need to read the back of that package and make an informed decision. Absolutely. Uh, because there are, there are those brands out there still using those ingredients and having no problem doing it. Okay. So we, as consumers, again, boy, it just, sometimes it's like a podcast like this almost makes you feel a little helpless because it's like, what are we supposed to do? Um, but I think the message that you're trying to say is dig deeper and do more research on the products that you're using. Um, what, what, what are we thoughts on like, you know, now going back to hair care specific things, because I know you and I've talked about this offline, heat protectant, right? Heat protectant is one of the ones. And I remember I asked you once and I'm like, well, what is the temperature? And you're like, no, 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 it's not. The temperature is, is, is it, I don't want to say irrelevant, but you were like, there's so much misinformation about heat protection. Can you tell us a little bit about what you think of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I'm a market, I'm a hairstylist, but I'm also a marketer. And that's why right. I looked, you know, product claims and, you know, the women known situation. And I really, and maybe it's the Gen Xer in me, you know, I kind of question everything, you know, loud and proud, I, loud yeah. and proud, baby. We're Gen X. Absolutely. So, you know, temperature is another one of those things that, that's being utilized to just simply sell um, more products. And um, there are blanket statements being thrown out there that we will protect your hair under 450 degrees. And that is scary to me because at 451 degrees, um, paper will auto ignite and burst into flames. So, you know, maybe if your hair has that really thick outer cuticular layer and is, you know, in fabulous condition, no chemically treated, maybe that's a good thing. But right. if you've got fine hair, thin hair, over processed hair, hair that maybe is a little environmentally damaged, maybe you're an outdoor uh, enthusiast, you know, saying to a consumer, that your hair is going to be protected against any sort of, you know, thermal, you know, thermal um, heat up to 450 degrees really is disingenuous. And I think it's just being utilized to sell products. You know, it's crazy. So what, what do you recommend? Because you are a professional stylist, you know, what temperature should we have? Cause I feel like my, I feel like my hair straightener and my curling iron maybe they go above 450 degrees, maybe not, but I feel like the baseline, cause I have one of the ones that you can adjust. And I feel like when I turn it on, it's baseline is 425. So is that like way too hot? Well, think about what we cook in the oven at 450, right? Do we cook a everything. lot of things? At 450? I'm you so do? impatient. Okay. I, I put everything in at 450 vegetables, salmon, okay. salmon's okay. actually okay. better at. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's, again, it depends on your hair type. What's going on with your hair type? What is it naturally? My hair is very um, curly and fine and, and naturally um, in a very precarious situation. So maybe I should use a lower heat level Got than it. someone like you with this beautiful, you know, what looks to be a great cuticular layer and just not a lot of damage going on. Maybe you can use a higher heat. So it's just not a one size fits all sort mm. of thing. But I always tell my girlfriends, I'm like, start lower, work your way up. See if you really need that. Uh, I was surprised that my, my curling iron, I think it starts at 425. And I always try to bring it down a little bit because that's I, for my hair, which I've actually got very fine hair. Um, right. So maybe you should start a little bit lower. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the products will afford heat protection. Right. So I just want to set that straight. Um, but to say that, girl, crank that up to 450 degrees, we got you. Right is, is, is where I, I have an issue because I've seen many a thermal induced haircut, fatally fatal, fatal haircuts via thermal appliance. So do you that remember was, that? I don't remember. They're like in early YouTube days, there was a girl or maybe it was early Instagram. She was doing a hair tutorial. She looked to be about, I don't know, 15 years old and she's doing her hair and she's like, and then I just curl it here and you see it start to smoke and she pulls it off and the whole thing comes off. I don't know if you remember that. Oh. I My friend said that. that to me and I was just like, oh, poor girl. So I do, I do remember that. So I you can get a that. chemical haircut if you overprocess and you can get a heat haircut if you Absolutely. keep your styling tool on. 
Absolutely. And I guess, I guess, you know, today's foundation would be to just basically question everything because if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And bear in mind that when it comes to hair care and personal care, the FDA hasn't done the work to protect us ahead of time. They only do it after the fact. So we've got to take that responsibility upon ourselves to really educate ourselves and know what's going to keep us safe, you know, and, and start with those hero ingredients, really, really question those. So is, so let's talk now. We've talked about sort of like the, the dirty secrets. Um, what about some of the saints of the hair care line, right? So are there any um, are there any hero ingredients that you're finding that you really believe in? You know, there, there are so many tried and true ingredients out okay. there. And like I said earlier, it's, you know, really about the totality of a formulation. You know, this, this is going to sound, uh, you know, very simplistic, but I'm a big fan of the coconut. I, I love, okay. I love a coconut. And I really want to clarify too, that even though it's called coconut, it's actually not a nut. We get this right. question all the time because we use it in, in quite a few products. Um, that it's actually what's called a droop, very similar to a peach. A peach has sort of that that thicker outside shell with that little bit of peach fuzz on it. A coconut is also a droop. We love uh, uh, olive oil. We love okay. um, prickly pear seed oil. I grew up in the desert, so I was always enamored by these desert botanicals and their ability to withstand heat and retain moisture. So we're a big fan of those. Um, yeah. So lots of great ingredients like jojoba is another good one. So lots jojoba. Of good yeah. yeah. Is there any, yeah. and, 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 you know, I know we were saying that there were um, a lot of companies that are sort of maybe not doing great things for us. Are there any other lines, hair care, beauty that, that you feel like are really kind of looking out for us that you stand behind in addition, of course, to saints and sinners? Right. You know, there are so many good ones. Um, uh, and, and there are, you know, the, the ones that we really probably would want to avoid, you know, if, if I'm going to use something other than saints and sinners, I would, I would use a Davines product. I, I think Davines okay. and, and Dupilati is a, is a great, um, that those, that those are great products, great brand. I like what they stand for. And, um, yeah, I could definitely, I know I like the two popular ones Orbe, right? Orbe you see everywhere here. Um, I feel like my friend who was a stylist, uh, Ryan, he, he loved it. He said, one of the interesting things was, um, actually it was his shampoo guy was like, you know, who's shampooing and their hands are in water all the time. And they were like, when we switched to Orbe, our hands stopped feeling dry. Right. Do you feel that's, like there's any, like, cause that's an expensive line. That's a super expensive line, but do you feel like it it holds up to its? You know, um, I'm, there are some Orbe products that I, that I really, really like. I do um, like the fact that he noticed that perhaps they were a pH balance line, Mm. pH potential hydrogen. It's a acidity to alkalinity scale. So we want to keep our hair, skin and nails between 4.5 and 5.5. And if he all of a sudden noticed his hands feeling better, then perhaps that product he was using was within the, the proper pH. Gotcha. So all of these things, things, these things matter. And that's why having industry experience when it comes to formulation really can impact the final result and keep us healthy and safe first and foremost. Right. Um, and, and what about women-owned brands? Are there any women-owned brands that you really support? Um, there's lots of, uh, skincare women-owned brands that I love. Um, you know, as far as the hair care space, I can't, none are, none are popping to popping mind. up. But what about then skincare? Uh, Sunday Riley. Sunday Riley. Oh, I, we've interviewed her for new beauty live before. She's lovely. People Sunday just love Riley. her stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Something I can stand behind. And I probably got a bazillion of her products in uh, my boudoir. But <laughs> yeah, I just, I just think it's it's really imperative that not just for the brands owned by women, but everybody, we as consumers educate ourselves, stop using those ingredients that have those parabens and phthalates. I just can't stress it enough. Um, it's personal to me. I've lost loved ones. And, you know, I just, I just want to see us, you know, kept safe first and foremost. Absolutely. You know, um, I want to thank you so much for being on with us today. Is there anything exciting coming up with Saints and Sinners? 
Well, there may be um, some award talk coming up. Yes, yes. Actually, that will be tomorrow. So this is airing on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, I will be with Diana. Thank you for queuing it up for um, New Beauty's 12th Annual Beauty Awards being featured on Beauty Pass Live. So make sure to go to our social media. You can get the link. It's free. By the way, in that show, there are $24,000 in giveaways. It is Amazing. insane. So even if you Amazing. didn't get the fabulous box of which your hair mask, which is epic, is going to be in, um, you will have access to win. I mean, I think there's like Versace sunglasses. Um, there's so La Prairie Skincare is doing one. New Face, that device is doing one. I mean, it's insane. So we should definitely tune in. And we're going to be talking about your gorgeous hair mask. Velvet to divine hair mask. Absolutely. Can't wait to talk about it. It is lovely. So make sure to tune in tomorrow. Diana, thank you for coming on to talk dirty secrets with us. So much fun. Hair care so confessionals. Much fun. I'm Amber. <laughs> if people want to know more about Saints and Sinners, if they want to know more about you, where can they go? Absolutely. Follow us at Real Saints and Sinners. And I am the Synergist. So come and say hi. I love it, the synergist. And if you have any questions at home you want me to pass along to Diana, I'm always happy to do that. You can email me at hello at rpdpodcast.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and right here on YouTube at Podcast. And as always, we will see you next Tuesday. But I hope we see you tomorrow because that's what's going to happen. This is airing on Tuesday, so tomorrow will be Wednesday. And that's when Diana and I will be on Beauty Pass Live. So see you then. 